I'm the director and producer of the film Punk in Africa, which is a documentary about the history and evolution of punk rock in three Southern African countries. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Brown. I'm a producer on the film. Keith and I live in Prague. Uh, we have produced another film in South Africa, and that's in short how we got involved in the film. a story which had not yet been told. It was a, a history which had been overlooked. And I think in South Africa and also in Mozambique and Zimbabwe, the other countries we filmed in for that film, there's a danger of certain stories being left by the wayside. So much tumultuous activity has taken place in recent decades that uh, a lot of things have just been left unsaid or unspoken or, or haven't been properly documented. And I had the feeling with the, the, the backstory to the punk film that, that it was something similar. I think it, it arrived through a combination of factors. One was that the 60s, uh, as we refer to it in the West, really didn't happen in Southern Africa. They were the last places that were still sort of shrouded in, in this very backwards looking form of colonialism uh, as late as, as the early 70s really, I mean well, even later in the cases in Zimbabwe, and they were really the last countries to, to be liberated on the African continent and so that euphoria of the independence years and also the, the popular culture of the 60s and the element of rebellion and revolt that went along with that was just completely missing and it was something that I think people were actually starved for and when punk arrived, it happened more or less at the same time as the Soweto uprising. And as one of the characters in the film says, those those energies kind of met into something that was much more political than how punk played out in other societies, where it was more of a social thing or not that, uh, that it wasn't important in, in the United Kingdom or the United States or other societies. It just existed in, in a framework more or less within popular culture. Whereas the, the, the whole punk philosophy, uh, when transplanted to Africa, becomes inherently very political. The punk scene was multiracial almost from the beginning uh, in South Africa. In Zimbabwe and in Mozambique, uh, which are other countries that we treat in the film, the punk scene came along a bit later. And it was already heavily influenced by what was happening in South Africa in the first place. So it, it was completely multiracial in those countries. When that was happening in South Africa in the late 70s, early 80s, that was actually a dangerous thing. That was a, technically against the law. Mm -hmm. And the, the bands that were multiracial at that time in the punk scene had real difficulty performing. You know, what these guys were doing, they were getting harassed quite a bit uh, for these shows that they were putting on. And a lot of these were sometimes uh, secret shows. So I think they were putting themselves in harm's way with the authorities for for putting on these shows and they were mixed race shows one thing that all of the early punk bands uh, from the first punk band in africa wild youth from the city of durban on was that to connect to an audience they all went out and played in townships and rural areas and in predominantly non-white areas uh, from the start one thing that um, that i would add to that is that everyone knows that the history of south african jazz is this uniquely multiracial thing which took place within music. That's a story that's been very well told. But punk is actually the second important and, and, and second existing multiracial music scene in South Africa, also uh, as a form of protest music, as South African jazz was. And, and I think that that shapes the attitudes towards race within the punk scene there, and it continues to do so until now. It, it contributed to a broader struggle. It was one thread that, that made up a bigger tapestry. And in a situation like South Africa during the 80s or Mozambique during the Civil War, it's important to take a stand, and Punk did that. Uh, in terms of specifically how it interacts with, with African culture, I think a lot of aspects of the Punk philosophy sort of fit very well in Africa. I mean, the, the DIY aesthetic is 
a conscious choice for a lot of people in the punk scene worldwide. In Africa, that's just basic survival. That's just living in the third world is a DIY experience anyway, to begin mm -hmm. with. One of the things that actually bound the story together, which created a, an organic background to, to the overall history of the story, was that all of these punk scenes always embraced African identity as a, as a central focus of what they were doing. All of these bands, all of these visual artists, all of these people involved with the punk scene always put their Africanness at the, at the center of their worldview. And that's reflected in the music, it's reflected in the, the attitudes that were projected. I think that that's one thing that the film conveys very strongly, is a, is a pride in African identity, and mm -hmm. rightfully so. Yeah, I think that's a fabulous point he just made. Um, because it happens all the time that people are asking what's the difference or how does punk culture differ or how does the music differ and you can just hear it at least i can um, i think other people will as well is that you can just hear it in the guitar bits you can hear it in the drums um you can hear it just in the way it all comes together even there's something about this simple three chord just the three chord old school approach to punk somehow has this this certain african feel to it all the way up through now through some of the ska stuff that the film um, segues into later on. The research to the film uh, basically took me the, the better part of a year uh, to, to, to really track down everything and, and, and begin to, to make sense of the story. And I often refer to this as my first Facebook film. It was the first film in which social networking and these sort of internet-based platforms really played a very important role in tracking things down and doing research and finding out where the archives were. I would say 90% of the archive footage we use in the film, we got directly from and the musicians themselves. The, the footage that Ivan Cady from the band National Wake had tucked away in his basement somewhere in Los Angeles that he hadn't looked at in 30 years. As soon as we saw this stuff, it was just mind-blowingly good. There's yeah. quite a lot of that footage is used in the film, and uh, there, there was no way not to use it. It was it was difficult not to use more of it. The, the footage was, was incredible, and it was like a window into a completely alternative way of looking at South Africa during the 80s. It was mm -hmm. just something I had literally never seen before. Jeffrey and I actually also had a big adventure finding the Mozambican archive footage that we used in the film, which we tracked down in Europe. It's actually footage that was shot for DDR propaganda newsreels in East Germany and ended up in film archives in Slovakia and the Czech Republic where we tracked it down. And it's also pretty incredible footage of the Mozambican war that I don't think anybody has seen in over 30 years. We were all getting blown away by the stuff that was coming through and as Keith suggested that National Wake stuff is is great and the music's great and one of the songs international <clears throat> international news is is a song that you will have trouble getting out of your head once you hear it yes and bizarrely the song international news has all of a sudden become quite timely and relevant again with the passage of, of the secrecy act by oh, right. the South African Parliament, yeah. which which drags things back to the the period of time which is which is the song is talking about. That in order to find out what's going on, you have to look to the international news because of internal censorship. I mean, I just hope that they enjoy the film and that they are entertained by it, and that it causes them to think about a history that's that's. Um, that maybe they've thought about before, but not in this way. I mean, we've had a great response showing it to South African and Czech audiences because people are quite moved by seeing this kind of story, to see a, a punk film in an African context or to look at African history in a punk context. I, I'm always, I always shy away from films or filmmakers who are trying to beat you over the head with teaching you something or they want people to learn something. I, I do think that the great thing about the film is it, it's a good... It's a, it's a good thing to watch. You get it's you get a good kick out of it. It's entertaining. As we've said before, it's it's the history of Southern Africa with a very cool soundtrack. 
films, uh, our sales agent is uh, Rise and Shine Films out of Berlin. Um, we premiered the film in July at the Durban International Film Festival um, at the end of July. Uh, we've also shown it thus far at the uh, Rio de Janeiro International Film Festival in October. Um, we are, we've yet to premiere it and we're waiting where it will premiere in North America and we will be premiering it um, in, in, the, in Europe at the beginning of next year. Our website's punkinafrica.co.za um, and we will be coming forward with, as we announce these premieres, that will be a good place to check it out, as well as we're asked a lot um, through our Facebook page as well as through the website when our DVD is coming out, and people can keep a lookout for that at the beginning of next year. Yeah. Thanks for having us. I have to say that places like OK Africa and similar sites that, that take that approach to looking at contemporary African urban culture are really important to, to us as a team. It's where we've always wanted the dialogue and the discussion around our film to be taking place. So it's, it's, it's great for us also to, to be invited onto OK Africa.